Understand that agriculture is not only the economic lifeblood of many rural communities, it's central to our values and our way of life. That is why it is important for us to be unified and to move in an action when our industry comes under attack. The National Cotton Council's 2016 agenda focused on enhancing existing cotton policy as a way to improve U.S. cotton's economic situation while simultaneously advancing the industry's priorities on appropriations, trade, and regulatory issues. The industry received a timely short-term boost after USDA implemented its cotton ginning cost share program. The Council continues to advance the cotton seed designation for consideration prior to the next Farm Bill's development. On the trade front, the Council expressed concerns about ongoing cotton and synthetic fiber policies of major agricultural producing countries, including India and China. The Council vigorously addressed regulatory issues threatening to undermine U.S. cotton. A key focus was with EPA and the registration or re-registration of key crop protection products. Joining more than 250 organizations representing agriculture and other key sectors, the Council signed a letter to the House and Senate Budget and Appropriation Committee's chairman and ranking members, urging rejection of additional cuts to programs within the jurisdiction of the Senate and House Agriculture Committees. The Council submitted specific Fiscal Year 17 Agriculture Appropriations requests to both the House and Senate Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittees. Both committees approved versions of the FY17 Agriculture Appropriations Bill that included the NCC requested level for the cotton pests account and which fully funded both the MAP and the FMD program. The Senate Committee's report accompanying its Appropriations Bill also included directive language on several cotton and related provisions, among them encouraging the Secretary of Agriculture to continue to work with Congress and the industry to find a path forward on providing an adequate safety net for cotton seed. Let's be very clear that that is an oil seed, a designated oil seed for the purposes of participation in the PLC. I think that's probably the more, or the less risky approach. The Family Business Coalition, of which the council is a member, sent a letter signed by 119 organizations to Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, opposing Treasury's proposed changes regarding Section 2704 on estate and gift tax valuation discounts. The council and 23 other organizations sent a letter to the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition and Forestry Committee in support of the Commodity End User Relief Act. That committee later approved the measure, which reauthorized the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The House Armed Services Committee's consideration of its version of the annual defense authorization bill as it moved to the full House for consideration was closely monitored by the council. Late in the year, Congress approved the FY17 National Defense Authorization Act which included continuation of the Berry Amendment and provisions favorable to the U.S. textile industry. The Council worked with Congress and the Department of Labor to determine how the agency's new overtime rule would affect the agricultural community. Late in the year, a federal judge in Texas granted a preliminary injunction to delay implementation of the new overtime rule. The 2014 Farm Bill includes statutory authority for the USDA to designate other oil seeds for inclusion in Farm Bill programs. The infrastructure for the cotton industry will continue to shrink unless there is a stabilizing policy for cotton to help sustain the industry in periods of financial pressures such as currently exist. Early in the year, after Agriculture Secretary Thomas Vilsack commented that USDA believed its legal interpretation of the Farm Bill did not provide the authority to make the designation of cotton seed as an other oil seed, the Council issued a statement conveying its extreme disappointment. The Council continued its outreach to Cotton Belt members and to USDA regarding the urgency for policymakers to take action and find ways to help address the significant economic challenges facing the industry. After Congress's continuing resolution bill did not include the Council's cottonseed proposal, Council staff and Congressional staff began work on any modifications needed to the proposal so it would be ready for consideration at the first legislative opportunity in 2017. Following USDA's announcement of the implementation and availability of commodity marketing certificates as part of the marketing loan program available to all loan-eligible commodities, the Council thanked Secretary Vilsack and his team for developing the necessary regulations and provisions. The Council also commended Secretary Vilsack for his efforts on making possible the Cotton Ginning Cost Share Program, Announced mid-year by USDA, the program provided about $330 million in one-time cost-share assistance payments 
to offset a portion of a cotton producer's 2015 crop season ginning costs. Secretary Vilsack announced a one-time 30-day extension of the June 1, 2016 status date for determining USDA program eligibility. Earlier, the Council had joined with 69 national, regional, and state commodity and farm organizations on a letter to the Secretary asking for an extension so that farms would have time to understand how the new actively engaged in farming regulations would affect them and what changes might be needed to remain in compliance. Late in the year, the Risk Management Agency announced updated factors for prevented planting coverage for seven crops, including cotton. The factors were based on recommendations of a 2013 USDA Office of Inspector General study. The Council subsequently submitted comments to RMA that noted serious concern with that study's methodology and that reiterated no change was warranted for cotton's prevented planting factor. After the U.S. Trade Representative filed a World Trade Organization complaint against China's price supports for corn, wheat, and rice, the Council issued a statement noting that the U.S. decision to pursue a challenge against Chinese agricultural subsidies for grain crops reflects a growing desire in the United States and abroad to address more effectively the range of policies in major developing countries that affect agricultural markets. Additionally, it stressed the importance that the multilateral discussions also review policies in all fiber markets, including synthetic fibers. As a result of the anti-dumping investigation of U.S. cotton, the Turkish Ministry of Economy released a report calling for the imposition of duties on U.S. cotton imports. As a result, Council staff traveled to Turkey to participate in a public hearing and present comments opposing the report's findings. Later, a 3% CIF, or Cost Insurance and Freight Duty, was imposed on all U.S. cotton fiber imports into Turkey, following the Turkish government's release of its final decision. In response, the Council issued a news release noting that Turkey was the second largest export market for U.S. cotton, and that these duties automatically put U.S. cotton at a competitive disadvantage to cotton produced in other countries thus seriously jeopardizing business with Turkish mills. Council Chairman Shane Stevens led an industry leadership delegation to China to share information with the Chinese cotton textile industries and update them on the U.S. cotton industry. The Council consistently conveyed the industry's positions and concerns to congressional members and key government agency officials regarding critical legislative, trade, regulatory, and environmental matters. Early in the year, the Council escalated its call for cotton seed to be designated as an other oil seed. The communications effort included submitting letters to the editor to nearly 60 newspapers across the cotton belt. The Council also arranged interviews for cotton leaders with trade media and utilized social media outlets, including Facebook and Twitter, to widen the visibility and further gain Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack's attention on the matter. The Council added to its social media campaign across Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and podcast via YouTube, with the addition of another platform, Instagram. The posts on these outlets highlight news and information from the NCC, Cotton Council International, and the broader cotton industry. Late in the year, the Council initiated a redesign of its website, which it continued to utilize along with its Cotton's Week newsletter, radio news lines, videos, and columns in various trade publications for disseminating key information to its members. Updates were completed on cotton educational videos covering harvest safety and contamination prevention. The contamination prevention video was one of many elements of the Council's Keep It Clean initiative, which also included updated materials and a new page on the website containing links to the contamination prevention resources. The Council worked with Congress to ensure that executive agencies' regulatory processes were transparent and included stakeholder input when developing rules and regulations. That included monitoring the status of the House passed Regulatory Integrity Act. Specifically, the Council, along with other agricultural organizations, sent a letter to House Agriculture Committee Chairman Michael Conaway and Ranking Member Colin Peterson, highlighting concerns with EPA's general conduct. 
A letter to Conaway and Peterson from the Council and other commodity and agricultural groups conveyed agriculture's concerns with EPA's new worker protection standards that were set to go in effect on January 2, 2017. The Council's work with Congress and the administration on the prevention of overreaching regulations included submitting a statement of record to a House Agriculture Committee's Subcommittee on Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research, hearing about factors affecting producers' production costs. The Pesticide Policy Coalition, of which the Council is a member, submitted comments in a letter to EPA on the proposed reissuance of its five-year National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Pesticide General Permit. In addition, the Council and others continued urging EPA to work with states when developing provisions and for the agency to maintain its long-standing view that the need for regulatory certainty and finality in decision-making outweighs any claimed interest. The House passed the Zika Vector Control Act, which was received in the Senate and was awaiting action. The measure would prevent EPA from requiring NPDES permits for any pesticides that are already authorized for sale, distribution, or use under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. The Council was represented by Alan McLaurin, a North Carolina cotton producer, on the Pesticide Policy Dialogue Committee, a broadly representative federal advisory committee that considers a variety of issues related to pesticide regulatory development and reform initiatives, public policy, and program implementation. Throughout 2016, the Council continued to work with others in the agricultural community to ensure EPA relied on credible scientific data and required all studies to be subject to the same requirements as those required of product registrants. The Council submitted comments on EPA's draft human health and ecological risk assessments for the registration review of a group of 35 different pesticides reported by EPA as sulfonylureas and other identified chemicals. Among the other identified chemicals were several organophosphate pesticides. Throughout 2016, the Council conveyed to EPA the importance of having access to a diverse arsenal of crop protection products with different modes of action to combat currently resistant weeds and pests and to prevent or delay new resistance development. The Council submitted detailed comments conveying the industry's full support for the registration of Monsanto's dicamba formulations for use on USDA deregulated dicamba tolerant cotton while underscoring the importance of effective weed management needed for successful cotton production. Late in the year, EPA announced that they would register a dicamba formulation, Extendamax, with vapor grip technology. EPA did issue a new registration for sulfoxiflor that did not include a label for cotton and sorghum. Prior to that action, the Council had provided supporting comments to the EPA docket regarding the agency's public notice that the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, Arkansas State Plant Board, and Mississippi Department of Agriculture requested emergency exemptions to use sulfoxiflor for control of tarnished plant bugs and cotton. The Council joined cotton interest associations and boll weevil eradication foundations in filing comments on EPA's draft Malathion Human Health Assessment. Late in the year, the Council commended EPA for confirming its original decision to register Dow AgroSciences herbicide Enlist Duo after determining the product did not show any increased toxicity. EPA also proposed to add genetically engineered cotton to the label, along with GE corn and soybeans, as well as increase the number of states where Enlist Duo can be used from 15 to 34. In comments submitted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the proposed endangered listing of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, the Council conveyed its disagreement with the science that the service used and stated that the service needed sound scientific evidence before moving forward with such a far-reaching listing. Late in the year, the ITMF released Cotton Contamination Survey 2005 to 2016 revealed that very clean raw cottons were produced in the United States and that U.S. growths were perceived to be less contaminated in 2016 than in 2013. Prior to the 2016 harvest season, the Council had urged U.S. cotton industry members to increase their focus on the prevention of contamination in seed cotton and lint. More than 125 international and local cotton leads partners and supporters across the global cotton supply chain attended a conference in Hong Kong themed Moving Toward Sustainability in the Supply Chain. The Cotton Leads Partner Conference focused on responsible cotton production and textile manufacturing. Cotton Council International continued to promote U.S. cotton in more than 50 countries in Asia, Europe, Africa, and Central and South America. CCI ramped up global initiatives aimed at instilling a preference for U.S. cotton and cotton products throughout the marketing chain. 
Specifically, U.S. cotton was vigorously promoted among yarn spinners, fabric garment manufacturers, brands, retailers, and consumers. CCI revised its global licensing program to increase participation. Cotton USA licensed cotton user firms throughout the supply chain are using the Cotton USA Mark logo to distinguish products at retail that contain a majority of U.S. cotton. Among CCI's many promotions were the annual Cotton Days, where CCI President Keith Lucas helped draw attention to U.S. cotton's high quality in the key markets of Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. The first Cotton USA pop-up store opened in Bangkok, Thailand at the world's sixth largest shopping complex where women's and men's wear collections from two Cotton USA licensees were accentuated. Another first was successful Chinese apartment complex promotions where visitors were inspired to decorate with U.S. cotton-rich home textiles. Cotton USA also showed how the comfort of U.S. cotton bedding and towels can make people feel home away from home through its booth at the Intertextile Shanghai Home Textile Show in China. CCI, Cotton Incorporated, and the U.S. cotton industry, in cooperation with USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service, hosted the Biennial Sourcing USA Summit in California. A sold-out audience of the most influential executives in the global cotton fiber and textile business, representing 31 countries, shared information ranging from managing cotton market risk to improving textile processing. These firms' networking was expected to result in significant sales of U.S. cotton. The Cotton Foundation Board of Trustees approved funding for 16 general research projects totaling $279,000. Approved projects included studies related to pest management, sustainability, pollinator protection, agronomic practices, and education. Some foundation member firms provided grants over and above their dues to fund special projects. Support also was maintained for vital NCC communications vehicles, including the Cotton's Week newsletter. Looking forward, we know that pending legislation, potential cotton seed designation, trade policy, environmental, economic, and regulatory issues will remain as priorities and challenges for this industry. Council staff and leadership will work together to actively manage the many issues that face the industry in the months to come. Strong industry participation in the organization and politically active industry leaders will continue to be needed in order to assure future success for U.S. cotton. With the structure in place and the visionary leadership being so willing to assist, the industry is well positioned for the future.